Hello, and thank you for joining us uh, at the Gateway again. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking at the Bible study again tonight. Uh, we're uh, actually in the book of James, uh, and so we're going to be picking up tonight uh, with James chapter 3, verse 1 through 18. Uh, last week, um, just for a, kind of a quick review, um, James really spent a lot of time talking about true faith, about what true faith looks like. Um, the, the fact that true faith will, will express itself through our actions. Um, you know, if you have a, a, a true relationship with Jesus Christ and you, 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 your faith is in him and you're uh, serious about your relationship with him, uh, that's going to do something through your life. You're going to see it. It's going to be visible. So James spent quite a bit of time talking about that. And then James actually gave us some examples. He gave us an example from Abraham's life uh, when, a, when Abraham took Isaac up on the mountain to, uh, to sacrifice him at the Lord's command. And, of course, the Lord intervened uh, and, and before that happened, before uh, he killed Isaac. But, um, you know, James was talking about that Abraham's faith was made perfect or complete through what he did, and he was righteous before God because of it. Then he talks about Rahab the harlot who took in the spies and hid them and protected them, and then she sent them out a different direction um, from the people who were looking to, to kill the Israelite spies. So James made a really good, solid case on the fact that true God-honoring faith will express itself and will do something through our life. So that's what last week's study was about. Uh, so this week, we're going to go ahead and jump into the Word. So this week, we're in James chapter 3, verse 1 through 18. And here we go. In verse 1, it says, My dear brothers and sisters, don't be so eager to become a teacher in the church, since you know that we who teach are held to a higher standard of judgment. Um, you know, this, this is a big deal. You know, I talked uh, just a couple of services ago about uh, judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, where every believer will stand to answer for what they did in this life, in this body. And um, for those who teach, those who teach um, the scripture, teach in the church, uh, you know, have that, that, that position of influence, there will be a stricter judgment because when you teach someone the word of God, uh, you better do all that's within you with prayer and, 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 and great care to teach the scripture accurately. Um, you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to mislead people. Um, you know, like the scripture says that, you know, if, 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 if a teacher's blind and they're leading someone, uh, they'll both fall in the ditch. So the blind leading the blind, both will fall in the ditch. And that's very much what will happen is if, if you're teaching um, and you don't teach the word accurately, at some point that, that false teaching or that misunderstanding of scripture, it'll reach a point in your life to where um, the trial happens or you get tested or the heat gets turned up somewhere in your life or some big event hits you upside the head that you're not expecting. <clears throat> and then you'll try to stand on that, that, that teaching that you thought was right. But if it's not accurate biblically, it won't hold you. It will not sustain you. It won't give you life in those tough places. That's why it's important to, to accurately uh, learn the scripture. Like uh, Timothy says, to rightly divide the word of truth. I think Paul was writing to Timothy uh, there, said to rightly divide the word of truth. You, truth. You've got to be careful on how you, uh, how you uh, divide the scripture, how you look at it, how you break it down, how you interpret it, how you understand it. So be real careful with that. But also teachers will have a stricter judgment. Um, I teach a lot and I take that very seriously. That's why I spend so many hours studying the scripture and so many hours in prayer is because um, it's a privilege to teach, but also it's a huge responsibility. And one day I'm going to answer for it, as will every other person who teaches the scripture. So just keep that in mind. So that's what James talking about. It says, don't be so eager to teach because uh, while it may be fun or it may look like it's uh, you know, a big opportunity or a big privilege, which it is, you also are going to have to answer for everything you teach. So don't be so eager to, to jump up and be a teacher in the church. Do it if God's called you to do it, but, but you don't want to do it ahead of time, and you certainly don't want to do it if God didn't call you to it. Amen. Now we're going to read verse 2 through 4, and then we're going to, going to break this down and look at him. It says, We all fail in many areas, but especially with our words. Amen to that. Yet, if we're able to bridle the words we say, we are powerful enough to control ourselves in every way. 
and that means our character is mature and fully developed. Horses have bits and bridles in their mouths so that we can control and guide their large body. And the same with the mighty ships. <clears throat> Excuse me. Though they are massive and driven by fierce winds, yet they are steered by a tiny rudder at the direction of the person at the helm. So let's let's pull a few things out of here, and then I want to talk about um, uh, a bigger picture of what James is saying here. All right, first of all, if you look, it's, uh, he's talking about a bridle in verse 2. It says, if we're able to bridle the words, all right, they are, that we say they're powerful enough to control our whole life in every way. So he's talking about a bridle in our mouth. If we bridle our words, bridle the things, control the things that come out of our mouth, we can actually control our entire lives through what we say. Now let's keep going. And then he takes it right on in to horses in verse 3. It talks about horses have bits and bridles in their mouths so that we can control and guide their large body. Once again, the same thing. The horse has a bridle in its mouth. And you can, when you turn the mouth and control the mouth of the horse, the entire large, powerful body will go in the direction that the mouth is controlled. All right. Um, next thing, if we look, he gets right on down in verse 4, and we're still in the same thought process. I love it. James does such a good job of being thorough. He says, with mighty ships, they're massive, they're huge. The wind blows them around. It says, yet they're steered by a tiny rudder at the direction of the person at the helm. Um, man, verse 4 is so clear for us with our tongue. Our tongue is a tiny rudder. Right there, it's a tiny rudder. Yet that little rudder will steer that whole ship and in fierce winds. I mean, I love the fact that the ships are driven by fierce winds, yet, yet the rudder will control the direction of the ship in spite of the fierce winds. You know, the devil's referred to as the prince of the power of the air. Um, so in, in a lot of ways, you can look at this verse as being uh, the, the enemy, the, 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 the plans, the schemes, the fiery darts, the attacks of the enemy, the, just the weirdness of the world. we got enough of that going on right now, don't we, church? But the weirdness of the world and just things happen that are not pleasant. And so the wind blows and beats against us just like it does that ship. But the rudder, our tongue, will control the fact of whether we get swept away by the wind or whether we're able to navigate through the wind and through the storms and make it safely through and make it through with, with well, with no permanent lasting damage that we have to deal with later. Amen. Uh, I want to kind of, let's expand this a little bit more. Um, our tongue is a creative force. If you remember in Genesis, the Bible starts out in Genesis, says God said or God spoke and it happened. Over and over again, God said and it happened. God spoke and it was. God said and it came into existence. See, uh, God didn't have to say a word when he created anything. He could have just thought it and it would have happened. But God was showing us, he was, he was establishing a biblical pattern for us as believers that whenever we speak, creative power is released and brings into our lives and our existence the things that were unseen. And so, same thing here. we got to be really careful what we speak because whatever we speak is going to navigate, it's going to steer our lives into that direction of that thing or into the existence of that thing we said. So, church, be careful with what comes out of your mouth. Um, it's a huge deal. It's a big deal. Um, so let's keep going. He's going to talk more about this, but I really want to hit that. Every time you say something, creative power is released, which steers your life and your body into that direction. Amen. And our mouth is really key to navigating and staying on course with God through fierce winds and through tests and trials. Okay. In verse 5, it says, And so the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it carries great power. Just what I was talking about says, just think of how a small flame can set a huge forest ablaze. And I left, a, I left the A there, which is the little study note from the Passion Translation. We're going to look at that in a second. But once again, our tongue releases huge, massive, creative power. And I love James. James just does such a good job of bringing things into a 
practical, tangible perspective. The power of our tongue can be compared to a small spark igniting an entire forest fire. That's how big uh, of an influence the tongue has on our life and on our destiny and our direction. That's also how big of an impact our tongue has in the lives of those around us. That's why the Bible says to bless and not curse. I think we're going to get that to that in a minute. But if you look through the scripture, all through Psalms and Proverbs, you'll see that it talks about speaking life, uh, speaking blessings, speaking encouragement, not being negative, not speaking you know degrading, destructive words, but always speaking beautiful, pleasing, healthy words. Okay, because of course, like the scripture says, how beautiful is the word in season? Amen. It's like honeycomb, sweetness to the bones. All right, let's keep going. So here's the note on this. I love it. I left it in here. So let's read the verse again, and then let's look at this. It says in verse 5 again, it says, And so the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it carries great power. And here's what it, the note on that. It says, Or, it's referring to the tongue, or boast of great things. The Aramaic can be translated, the tongue has dominion. Wow. What a, what, what a once again, an illustration of power, the power of the tongue. It has dominion. The, tr the tongue has that level of influence over our lives. It actually has dominion over our lives, depending on how we use it. Big stuff. I love it. Scripture's so good. Read your Bible. I say that all the time, but you're going to, you're going to keep hearing it. If you keep, if you come to the services or you're part of the Gateway Church uh, here in Squim, or you listen online, you'll hear me reference, read your Bible, study the scriptures, spend time with God. Uh, the devotions are your life source. Your time with God is your life source. He's your life source. And he manifests himself and, 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 and enjoys us through that devotion time. He does everywhere else, but particularly the devotions. Um, so let's keep going. In verse 6, it says, And the tongue is a fire. It can, can be compared to the sum total of wickedness and is the most dangerous part of our human body. Isn't that interesting? The tongue is more dangerous than any other part of our being. It corrupts the entire body and is a hellish flame. It releases a fire that can burn throughout the course of human existence. And that that's kind of scary. I mean, you read that, it's it's sobering is a good way to say it. It's sobering to realize that our tongue has that much influence. So God help us to be careful what comes out of our mouth. God help us to be mindful of what we're creating every time we say something, every word we speak, every time we proclaim or declare or share. Make sure that there's always life and blessing and encouragement and hope and strength just make sure that that's coming out because that's going to you you will you will live in a place of those things if that's what you're talking about. It says in verse seven it says for every wild animal on earth, including the birds, creeping reptiles, and creatures of sea and land, have been overpowered and tamed by humans, and that's the truth. Every creature on this earth has been either tamed, overpowered, controlled, whatever by people. And so I love that, you know, we can, we can overpower a whale or overpower an elephant, yet our tongue is something we struggle with. Isn't that amazing? It says, but the tongue is not able to be tamed. It is a fickle, unrestrained evil that spews out words full of toxic poison. Amen. Isn't that something? My goodness. Um, so um, I want let's to, get, let's keep going. This is fun. I'm sorry I had another thought, but. Not, not needed right now. In verse 9, it says, uh, We use our tongue to praise God our Father and then turn around and curse a person who was made in his very image. Uh, I don't know about you if you're watching, but I, I've, I've actually seen Christians do that um, a lot. Um, surprisingly, a lot. And we'll talk about that some more in a minute. But let's, go, let's look at verse 10. It says, out of the same mouth we pour out words of praise one minute and curses the next. My brothers and sisters, this should never be. Um, to, I'm going to talk just a little bit. Me and, me, and, me and my wife were part of a church years ago. And um, 
whenever someone would leave that church for whatever reason, I mean, God could be calling them somewhere else or, or they, just, they just stopped coming, whatever. <clears throat> One of the practices in that church was to pray for the people who left. While that sounds noble, I'm going to tell you what that looked like. It looked like seeking God, begging God to do several things to the person who left or the couple who left. It was God bring them to their knees. God do whatever it takes. Make them miserable, God. Uh, just whatever you want, to, whatever you have to do, God. Just destroy their life if necessary, but just just break them down and bring them back to the church. Um, while some people believe that is okay, you know, that's, that is a, a way to pray, um, that's actually a way to curse. That is not prayer. That is not biblical prayer. It's not the way to use our mouth. Um, God ain't in that. You know, if you're watching this and, you, and you, know, you maybe thought that it was okay to pray those type of things on people, um, you know, bless you. And I love you, and I want the best for you, but um, there's a better way, church. There's a better way. It is not to curse. It's not to be negative and nasty and degrading. And that's what James is saying right here. It's saying this should never be at the end of verse 10. You know, out of the same mouth, I'm going to read verse 10 again, out of the same mouth we pour out words of praise one minute and curses the next. And that's what I, you know, I've, I've experienced that and I've seen that. I've had people pray for me like that. I've had prophetic words in my life um, that individuals have shared me and said, man, there are people that are cursing you uh, left and right, uh, but don't worry. God has caused those, those undeserved curses to fall to the ground. And I know some of that was from the church we were part of because guess what? Me and my wife left as God was leading us somewhere else. And um, I'm sure that uh, they prayed for us the same way they prayed for many others. And so just keep that in mind in your prayer time. Bless. Even if somebody is, uh, is difficult, bless them. Love them. Be encouraging. Be, in, be, be filled with strength. Pray good things for them. Good things for yourself. Amen. Let's keep going. Okay. And that's in Romans 2, 4. It talks about the way to help people repent. Okay. And you'll notice it's not to pray negative, nasty things on them says in uh, Romans 2, 4, says, Do the riches of his extraordinary kindness make you take him for granted and despise him? Haven't you experienced how kind and understanding he has been to you? Don't mistake his tolerance for acceptance. Do you, do you realize that all the wealth of his extravagant kindness is meant to melt your heart and lead you into repentance? See, what the Bible saying is, is if somebody's off track or off the rails or they're, they're not living the way they're supposed to, um, the, what the scripture's saying here is saying that God isn't approving of that lifestyle. He's not blessing them being off track. What it does is he is loving them. He's being kind. He's being generous. His goodness is showering upon them because God's goodness and his kindness is actually what leads us to change. It's what melts our heart. It's just his overwhelming, amazing kindness is what melts our heart so that we will respond to him and, and, and repent and think and act differently. So know that if somebody, if you're praying for someone, his kindness is what's going to lead them to make better decisions. Uh, his goodness is what's going to help them to restore those relationships that need to be restored. So enough said about that. Let's keep rolling, church. All right, in verse 11 and 12, it says, Would you look for olives hanging on a fig tree or go to pick figs on a grapevine? <laughs> is, it, is it possible that fresh and bitter water can flow from the same spring? So neither can a bitter spring produce fresh water. Um, what James is saying here is that these things are not possible. You can't, uh, you can't pick olives on a fig tree. You can't pick figs on a grapevine. You know, fresh and bitter water can't come out of one spring. It's just not possible. So really what he's saying here is that that it should be impossible. It should be so weird and strange that it's not even doable for us to speak blessing one minute and cursing the next. That should be something that's impossible for us. And that's what James is uh, using the different 
uh, fruit analogy for. Right, so in verse 13, it says, If you consider yourself to be wise and one who understands the ways of God, advertise it with a beautiful, fruitful life guided by wisdom's gentleness. Mm, that's good. Never brag or boast about what you've done, and you'll prove that you're truly wise. That's, that's a big deal. Um, let me just, I'm just going to touch something briefly, and then we'll go on to the next verses. You know, um, if you really understand the ways of God, if you really are close to God, the way you express that is with a beautiful, fruitful life guided by wisdom's gentleness. You know, wisdom is gentle. It is. Wisdom is gentle. I mean, there are times whenever you have to step in, and, you know, to something or respond with a, a, very, a very powerful, decisive response. But it's always going to have politeness and gentleness in it. All right, there's never there's never a reason to bully or push uh, push people around. All right, but then it closes in verse 13. It says, "Never brag or boast about what you've done, and you'll prove that you're truly wise." Um, you know, I visit with people quite often, and I talk with people quite often, and um, you know, I'm happy for people's successes, and I like to rejoice with them that rejoice. But um, you know, um, it always it always I don't know, it's always a little strange to me when somebody uh, consistently and regularly uh, points out all of their achievements, all of their accomplishments, um, all of their credentials to where they constantly bring up all of their experience and all that they bring to the table. It's almost like there's like a, um, I don't know, to me, to me, I'm just, a, I'm just a man of God. That's all. I'm a man who loves Jesus. You know, I'm just like you are. You know, um, I'm just I'm just following God, and I love Him. And the call on me is to preach, minister, pastor, uh, equip the saints for the work of ministry. And I'm doing the call, but the fact is, is you know, um, the call will express itself. Um, you know, the call makes room. The Bible says the call makes room for itself. And so, you know, I don't know. I just I, I just don't care for bragging. I'm just going to tell you, I don't care for bragging or boasting about what people have done. It's one thing if I ask a question or somebody, you know, there's a setting where that's appropriate. But church, just don't be, don't brag about yourself. You know, let God validate you. You know, unless the setting requires you sharing more than that. All right, let's keep going. Verse 14, it says, But if there is bitter jealousy or competition hiding in your heart, then don't deny it and try to compensate for it by boasting and being phony. Hmm. Amen. When it talks about bitter jealousy, now, see, envy and jealousy are different. Envy is, is, is okay to be envious from time to time. That's okay. But jealousy is another thing. Jealousy is not healthy and it's not good. But it says bitter jealousy or competition hiding in your heart. All right? Um, you know, you see that in the, in, the, in the business world. You see it on jobs. You see it in the church. You see people who are, who are very jealous of someone else's position or someone else's opportunities or someone else's blessings. Um, the thing is, is, that's why the Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice. You know, if they get a big win, bless them, God. You can be a little envious and say, man, I can't wait till mine comes. But, uh, but, but please don't let jealousy, um, well, sink in and get root in your life. Um, but it says, don't try to compensate for that by boasting and being phony. Um, you know, people put on masks, you know, they, they put on a mask and they'll pretend certain things to try to cover up for other things. So we've got to be careful not be phony. Be real, church. Be real. In verse 15, it says, for that has nothing to do with God's heavenly wisdom, but can best be described as the wisdom of this world, both selfish and devilish. Um, you know, if we're playing games, we're putting on masks, you know, all of us want to look good. I do, too. I know you do. All of us want to put our best foot forward. We want to look good and make good impressions, and that's good. But uh, we, we have to be careful that we don't cross over from just trying to, to, to look good and be presentable and, you know, and be above reproach to, to living a lie and being fake and phony with people. I mean, we, 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 things have to, you know, they have to come out somewhere sometime so we can deal with them. Amen. Um, and if we do try to cover up things and play a game for a long period of time, uh, that is selfish and devilish. That is not, that's not good for us. All right, so let's keep going. We're, we're 
doing good today. In verse 16, and so we're going to verse 18. In verse 16, it says, So wherever jealousy and selfishness are uncovered, you will also find many troubles and every kind of meanness. Um, the thing is, is if someone is in a place of jealousy, um, are they being really selfish about something? And, and, and it, if, if you're the person who's dealing with that and you really look down inside and start, you know, going there with the Holy Spirit and sorting through those things and, and, and receiving healing and letting him in those places with you, what's going to happen is when you see that jealousy that you have, that one area of jealousy or multiple areas of jealousy, or even that selfishness, wanting what somebody else has, what will happen is as soon as that's uncovered and you start looking into it and, re and it's revealed, you're going to find that there's a whole lot more nasty connected to it. It isn't just that one thing or that one area. That stuff bleeds over into other parts, other attitudes, other motives, other desire. Other things will be polluted because of the jealousy and the selfishness. And that's what it's talking about. Um, you'll find a lot of other trouble and every kind of meanness. And see, jealousy is. There's, jealousy is mean. It's nasty. It's not loving and caring. Selfishness is uh, by nature, it's me first, you know. I want this. It's I need this. It's me, me, me. And so there's meanness connected with that. And that's what the Bible's teaching. So, yeah, so when it's uncovered um, or whenever you're dealing with it, you know, expect to see some other roots going out in different areas of your life. So when you deal with it, um, stay there and deal with all of it and then move on with Jesus. Amen. So let's go to verse 17 says, but the wisdom from above is always pure, filled with peace, considerate and teachable. It is filled with love and never displays prejudice or hypocrisy in any form. All right, I, I have another translation. I have an NIV translation I want us to look at too, and then we're going to talk about this verse here. So this is the same verse, verse 17 in the NIV. It says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So I want to talk about this, just this right here. Okay, actually, I talk about this in the book I wrote on prophecy. Uh, this I talk about this because this is really, it deals with revelation. It deals with any wisdom from God, anything God gives you, any download, any perspective, any vision for your life, any word of revelation that you get, which would be, you know, once you share it, it'd be called prophecy. Anything like that, whenever God gives it to you, it is pure. It is totally pure. Um, and then if you notice, particularly in the NIV version, it says, then peace love. And so when you get it from God, it's pure. When he gives to you, it's absolutely pure and flawless and beautiful and glorious and, and awesome. All right. Then it becomes peace loving. Consider it submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. See, whatever God gives us for our life, whatever he shares with us to share with others, the thing is, it's pure and it's good when he gives it to us. But see, then when we share it with others, or whenever we walk it out, or we implement that wisdom into our life, uh, it's really neat because what that looks like is it's peace-loving. In other words, it, it, it loves peace with people. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's considerate. You know, if God gave you a vision, that vision will never, in, in, it will never involve you pushing and bulldozing and manipulating and controlling other people. It'll never, that'll never be part of a vision from God because the vision he gave you is pure. But when we walk it out, it's always going to be nice. It's going to be kind. It's going to be considerate. It's going to be peace loving. It's going to be submissive. You know, if everybody doesn't have to agree with you on everything you're doing if God put it in your heart. But that, but, but once again, that doesn't mean. You, we, we, we respond with aggressive, nasty, whatever, all right? Uh, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So just keep in mind with this verse. I know I kind of took a while with it. But in this verse, when God shares anything with us, it's beautiful and it's pure and it's flawless. But then when we walk it out, when we talk it out, when we work it out, it's going to be nice to other people. It's going to be gentle and peace-loving. It's going to be kind. It's going to work. So isn't that great? God gives it to us, and it's awesome. And then when we implement it and walk it out, it, it, it treats people with respect. Praise God. Okay. Verse 18, this is our last verse. And it always bears the beautiful harvest of righteousness. Okay. 
So that's what happens whenever, when God gives us wisdom in verse 17, when he shares his wisdom with us, and then we implement it into our life, and we, we do it with kindness and grace and peacefulness towards others. This is the, I love it. This is what happens when that, whenever the wisdom is implemented the right way. It always bears a beautiful harvest of righteousness. Good seeds of wisdom's fruit will be planted with peaceful acts by those who cherish making peace. Mm. Praise God. And I want to talk a little bit about the harvest of righteousness here. Because that's what happens when you're walking with God and you're doing what he put on your heart to do. And you're respecting and loving others. Guess what? The product of that is a harvest of righteousness. And so we've looked at this at the, at the church meetings, the group meetings. But I want to talk about righteousness. Righteousness includes three areas. All right? The first area is rightness with God. Amen. The second area is rightness with other people. The third area is rightness with yourself. So when it says a harvest of righteousness, that means you're going to harvest. You're going to bring in. And, and, and your life is going to be filled with rightness before God. But guess what? The harvest also includes uh, your life being filled up with rightness with other people. You're going to be right with other people. And then, lastly but not, not least, you're going to be right with yourself. You know, at the end of the day, you're going to be able to go to bed and be like, yeah, I treated people fairly. Yeah, God, I'm right. I have peace in my soul because... I did what you gave me to do, and I did it the right way uh, towards other people. So righteousness is rightness with God, rightness with others, and rightness with yourself. Praise God. And so that's our Bible study. I know it was a big one today, but, you know, James, uh, James, James, the book of James is a grocery store church. I mean, I know I use some interesting terms and phrases, but it's a grocery store. It's a buffet. It's a table a big table laden with wonderful food. And so um, thank you for, for sharing a meal with me today in the word. And uh, so let's close in prayer. God, thank you for your word. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for James. Thank you for the book of James, God. I know he's with you in glory right now, enjoying himself a lot. And God, I look forward to meeting him one day. In fact, every believer, every Christ follower who's watching this tonight, we will all meet James one day. James the just, as he was known, we'll all meet him in heaven in glory. And God, I can't wait. But thank you for using him to write this book that is so helpful. And God, I pray for everyone watching from home. God, encourage them. Strengthen them, God. Lord, I pray fresh vision. There are some watching who would like to have some fresh vision, who need some fresh vision for their life, God. God, I know I always want fresh vision. I pray that for the people watching. God, you give them fresh vision. Give them some, 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 some things, Lord, beyond where they're at that they can grab onto and walk out, Lord. And uh, God, I pray for wisdom from above, just like we saw in the scripture, that you give them some fresh wisdom for their life from above. And God, empower them to walk it out in kindness, grace, and peacefulness with those around them. And God, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us for Bible study. Hope to see you this Sunday, J.C. Penny Parking Lot, Squim, Washington. We have our uh, Sunday morning services, 10 a.m., drive-in services. We have a great time. Otherwise, see you back for Bible study Wednesday night next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.